Good evening and welcome to tonight's January Jumpstart. You have joined us for overcoming procrast the procrastination habit. Let's get started. So my name is Dr. Lisa Maddich. I'm the director of the Academic Support Center here at AU. If you've not been to the Academic Support Center yet, I invite you to come and visit us. Our office is located on the first floor of the Phillips Library in the, in the back right side of the building. Uh, if you need help finding us, please go to the front desk and a student worker will assist you. If you need to make an appointment with a tutor, whether it be a writing tutor or a tutor that is specific to the course that you're taking, please go on to Okta and click on Academic Support Net. That is where all the calendars are located for the different types of tutors that we provide, and you can make an appointment there that fits your schedule. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about overcoming procrastination. So what we're going to do tonight is a few different things. First, we're gonna talk kind of generally about procrastination and what it is. We're gonna talk about what we do when we procrastinate, what's actually happening. We're then gonna get into the why. Why do we procrastinate? We'll then talk about the procrastination cycle and why it's so hard to break. But then we're gonna talk about some more positive things. We're gonna talk about what works in terms of keeping yourself from procrastinating. And then at the end, we'll have some final thoughts and summary of what we've discussed. So no matter what people say, procrastination is not about being lazy. You will hear people claim that they do better when they procrastinate and work best under pressure. We're going to need to unpack both of these ideas today. One thing I did want to point out before we moved on is that you will see quotes throughout this presentation. I may not stop and read each of the quotes to you, but I wanted you to see what some famous people have said or written about procrastination and how it's affected their own lives. You will see comedians and famous writers with their thoughts on procrastination. So we're going to start off with a little Mark Twain, who said, never put off tomorrow what may be done day after tomorrow just as well. So let's talk a little bit more about what is happening when we procrastinate. So experts define procrastination as the voluntary delay of some important task that we intend to do, despite knowing that we'll suffer as a result. Procrastination is not waiting, it's actually more about delaying. It is a decision not to act. And more importantly, experts tell us that procrastination is really about emotional management. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's talk about some examples. What do we do when we procrastinate? If you procrastinate, then you always have the excuse of not having enough time in the event that you fail at doing the task. Because if you say to yourself, I didn't have enough time and it comes out really badly, then you've proven yourself correct. Your sense of your ability to do things is never really threatened because you didn't think you could do it in the first place. Our reasons for delaying and avoiding are rooted in fear and anxiety. We're worried about doing poorly, actually even worried about doing well, of losing control, of looking stupid, of having one sense of self or self-concept challenged. We avoid doing work to avoid our ability to be judged. And if we happen to succeed when we're procrastinating, we feel that much smarter. So for example, if you wait until the last minute to work on a paper and you actually get an A on that paper, well, then you feel pretty smart, don't you? Because even though you put it off, you still did just fine. Unfortunately, that's a trap. We'll have to talk about that. So with procrastination, what's really happening is that we're prioritizing our short-term needs over our long-term needs. And this is where emotional regulation comes into play. What we're doing when we procrastinate is actually kicking the can down the road. 
with the false hope that our future self will be in a better position to deal with the task. So I wanted to kind of get a little personal here. And I wanted to talk about my own procrastination problem with this presentation. I've been researching procrastination and the reasons behind it and this emotional regulation that we're going to talk about since November. I was excited to share this information with you. During our January jumpstart, I had bookmarked a bunch of things on my uh, Chrome browser. I had articles highlighted. I had notes from books and other resources. I had handouts created by some of the writing tutors at the Academic Support Center. All of this work was done, and yet I struggled to put my thoughts down to actually work on the presentation. So because of that, I thought to myself, maybe I should investigate my own reasons for procrastinating on this project. If the project's about procrastination, perhaps I should think about why I'm procrastinating. What I found was that I chose short, easy tasks to accomplish instead of working on this big task, this presentation. I could say at the end of the day, I did these 10 small things. Aren't I a good person? I congratulated myself on doing those 10 things. And yet I left this big task, this presentation, this high stakes task, because on Monday I had 430 people and today I have 235 and I had 200 and something yesterday. High stakes, right? Lots of you out there. I was putting off tomorrow, or just I was putting off to tomorrow what I could do today. What I found was that I would rather have had that sense of accomplishment from those 10 smaller tasks that I did instead of actually tackling this larger project. I was not emotionally ready to fail at this task. And so I procrastinated. So putting things off as long as possible is probably familiar to many of us, but there's another aspect to procrastination fear, fear of the unknown, of letting someone, most likely ourselves, down. There's a fear of failure. And this fear often comes at night. Be careful of panic-inducing nighttime talk that you do give to yourself, because everything is always more dramatic at night. All right, so I've come clean. Now it's your turn. Here's a quick poll. What I'd like you to do is choose one or more of these statements that tell me what your avoidance strategies are. TikTok runs out to the, be the beginning winner of this particular poll. Not surprising. I'm also guilty of that. Ooh, it's good to see some other cleaners in the group. I'm a cleaner. I wish my son was. Ugh, sometimes their rooms look like a battlefield. Yeah, a lot of this is, you know, obviously something portable, right? We can watch YouTube, we can do TikTok and Instagram, we can play video games, all that kind of stuff, all on our phone. So a lot of this is uh, something that we can take with us at all times. Oh, napping. Yeah, napping's a good one. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm going to take a nap. Yeah, that's a good one. Or I'm too tired to work on this. Anybody else have that conversation with yourself? So it seems like TikTok is the big winner at 74%. Uh, that's pretty significant, but it, I can see why, right? It's fun. It's easy. It's fast. They don't last very long. And we get something of value, right? Most of the time we're laughing at a TikTok, though not all, um, but we're entertained. And that's definitely a big part of it. All right, so we can see the results here. You can just see overall what everybody chose. So the, like I said, TikTok, big one, closely followed, well, not too closely, but followed by napping in YouTube. So I think those are both uh, great things to kind of to think about here. All right, so um, what we're gonna talk about now really is that 
um, what these strategies mean, what's going on here. You know, I told you that one of my strategies is to clean and that's pretty weird, right? Most people are not like, ah, I'm going to clean. Um, but when I have something big to do, that's usually where you will find my house to be the cleanest. I may not have cleaned out that particular closet in 10 years, but all of a sudden with this presentation looming, that closet is really, really clean. And I took several bags full of items to Goodwill. So let's talk more about the emotional aspects of procrastination. I had mentioned this earlier, but let's talk more about this emotional regulation that's going on. So emotional regulation is how we regulate behavior and impulse control to achieve a task or a goal. It's a habit. It affects everyone to some extent, and it's tied to the difficulty of managing our emotions surrounding the tasks that we have to complete. When we procrastinate, we're actually involving ourselves in something called a short-term mood repair. When we have big tasks in front of us, a lot of us go, oh, and that's okay. Totally understandable. But because we're kind of at sometimes feeling a little overwhelmed or stressed or a little anxious, um, procrastination is a short-term mood repair fixer. It comes in and helps us. Here's some biochemistry for you. Did you know that when you do something you enjoy, you get a dopamine hit? But did you know that when you avoid doing something and choose to do something else you want to do, you are giving yourself that dopamine hit? So for example, if you like TikTok, and a good chunk of us do, when you watch TikTok video, whether it's funny or sad or just somebody doing something, that gives you a little rush. That little rush is that dopamine. And your brain says, I like this. Dopamine makes me happy. TikTok makes me happy. And so when you avoid doing something and choose to do something else that you want to do, like watching a TikTok video, you're giving yourself that same dopamine hit. Procrastination makes us feel good because of those chemical feelings created by dopamine. To overcome procrastination, we need to understand that we, what we are doing is really attempting to manage our moods. We have to break ourselves of the procrastination cycle so that we have positive feelings when we don't procrastinate. We've got to get away from those little hits of dopamine. So let's talk about the procrastination cycle. As I mentioned, it's a tough one and it's hard to break. So this procrastination cycle, as you can see here, starts with we procrastinate. And after we get that short hit of procrastination and we get that dopamine hit from that TikTok video or the nap or whatever else we choose to do, we immediately will then feel guilty. We feel guilty because we know we should be doing something else. Then if we feel guilty long enough, we begin to panic. And this is where that nighttime talk comes in when you talk negatively to yourself oh my goodness, I got to get this done. I'm not doing it. What's going on? Then we start to make excuses. Well, I'll get to it, or I have more time tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, we're procrastinating again. And this cycle continues until we choose to break the cycle. Procrastinators carry accompanying feelings of guilt, shame, or anxiety with their decision to delay. This cycle is all about how we are feeling. All right, another poll. I'm gonna put this, this one up. What do you tell yourself most often to justify procrastination? I have more time later. It's not really that big of a deal. I do better under pressure. Boy, we say that a lot, don't we? I have so much to do, this will just have to wait. But wait until what? What magical things, what moons have to align for us to do that project? How often do we put other people in front of what we need to do? Well, if your friend calls up and says they need me, you drop everything and go. And I'm not saying you're a bad person for doing that. But recognize that part of that is procrastination as well. 
And then of course, one of the other ones that happens most often, it's not, uh, oh, that one's misspelled. No wonder nobody is gonna choose that one. It's not due yet. That's what it should say. It's not due yet. So I have plenty of time. Telling yourself you have time. All right, so two of the bigger ones, just the ones we mentioned at the beginning, right? I have more time later. My future self will miraculously have more time, right? Or I do better, better under pressure. Do you? Have you ever not done it under pressure? How's that gone? Remember, emotional management here, right? So as the poll highlighted, we tell ourselves a lot of different things about our procrastination. I'm sorry. We tell ourselves a lot of things to put off doing what we need, what we know needs to be done. This is all about our emotions. We feed into the procrastination cycle with something called negative talk, negative thinking, or negative self-talk. We feed into the procrastination cycle with this negative self-talk. But yet look at all the things that happen when we're looped into the cycle. So when you think you just can't do it, this negative self-talk is really what causes us anxiety. It erodes our confidence. And something that was interesting to me was that it disrupts your creativity. I never thought of it that way. And this was something that I learned while I was working on this presentation. The idea that if you tell yourself, um, I'm under a lot of pressure, I've got to get this done. I, it really actually interferes with your ability to create. And sometimes we think about creativity in terms of artwork or music, but what we have to think about creativity is that it's part of everything we do. Every homework assignment that we turn in requires us to have some creativity involved. Writing a paper and how you organize it and how you begin and end your paper requires creativity. So if we think about this procrastination, when you think you just can't do it and you're telling yourself that, that negative self-talk is actually gonna make it much more difficult to complete the task that you need it to do. But one thing that a lot of us don't understand is that long-term procrastination actually has long-term effects on our body. We often, if, if you're a procrastinator or what we like to call a chronic procrastinator, you do it often, you will find that you have problems sleeping. You will find that you may have bouts or increased bouts of depression. Again, you can have, get anxiety or increase the anxiety you already have. And the other one is it can play into giving you a sense of low self-esteem. When you procrastinate enough, you think I'm just, I, I just can't. Or uh, look at me, I keep putting it off again. That's negative self-talk. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. That makes you feel bad about who you are. So can you see why time management may not be the answer to the procrastination problem? It's not that you aren't making time, it's that when you have the time, you're choosing to do something else. So I'm not telling you to throw your planners in the garbage or to stop making to-do lists. What I want you to focus in on the fact is that you still need to allot time to get things done, but now we have to have better habits during those times when you're supposed to be working and we wanna keep you or we want to avoid procrastination during those times. So time management is different than procrastination. Procrastination is all about emotional management, how we regulate our emotions. But time management is about how we re regulate our behavior and our impulse control to achieve a task or goal. A, time, you know, a plan or a time management makes you aware of what you need to get done and the time in which you have to get it done. You can rearrange things. Time management is about arrangement, right? Prioritization, figuring out what tasks need to be done first and in what order. And time management's also about adaptation. If something comes up, then making a move so that items still have the same amount of time allotted to it that it would have had had the schedule gone 
perfectly the first time. Time management in itself is not a habit, but the actions that lead up to time management are. Procrastination is also a habit. It's something that you get into. Once you figure out that procrastination gives you something emotionally, you will tend to procrastinate more because everybody wants to feel good. Everybody wants that short-term happy feeling, right? So we need to talk about what works. We're gonna take all that information about procrastination and what we're actually doing and feeling, and we're gonna reframe it. So let's talk a little bit first about how we reframe procrastination. We know it's a, we know it's a habit. We know it has to do with our emotions. Can we reframe it so that we're getting a different outcome than kicking something down the road? So forgiveness and self-compassion. When you start to feel that either that you're going to procrastinate or that you have procrastinated, I want you to stop and realize what you're doing. Remind yourself that the thoughts that led up to your procrastination are really emotional regulation on your part. Forgive yourself for wanting to feel good and for wanting to procrastinate. Give yourself some grace. With that grace comes self-compassion, which actually increases your motivation. Feelings, it also increases your feelings of self-worth and other positive emotions. See how we're looking for ways to regulate our mood without that dopamine hit that we get from putting things off? Let's talk about this next small step. Let's start the task that you have to do, the assignment, uh, whatever task it is that you have to do, start it. Even if it's the next smallest task, the next smallest step, ask yourself, what is it? What's the first small step that you need to take? We know from the experts that motivation follows action. If you take that first small step, you move forward you will naturally continue to move forward. It's easier to move forward at that point. You've becoming motivated. So I like taking bigger items, bigger tasks, and chunking them into smaller bits and bites. And that's because if they're in smaller pieces, then it's easier to see what that next small step is. And all of a sudden, you'll find yourself doing two or three in a row without even realizing it because you have propelled yourself forward. So let me give you an example. You've got a paper due, right? The first next small step, I should say the next small step that you have to do, you've got to open a Word document or a Google doc and put your name on the paper. That's it. There, you've started your essay. Next small step. You will then realize that that step is over. You'll feel good about that step being over. You'll motivate yourself to start the next step. The, the other part I wanted to talk about with reframing procrastination has to do with ro removing roadblocks. Procrastination uh, is <laughs> it's a complicated thing, right? You need to actually create bar barriers to keep yourself from procrastinating. So you want to remove roadblocks. Let me give you an example. Let's say you decided that you're going to start going to the gym in the morning. The problem is, and I apologize for the dogs barking. If you can hear that, somebody rang the doorbell. If you get up in the morning and, well, you want to go to the gym, right? How many of us roll out of bed and go, oh, I don't want to get up this early. Oh, now I have to go to the gym. I really don't want to do this. So in terms of removing your roadblocks, if you wanna wake up and go to the gym first thing in the morning, sleep in your gym clothes. I know, sounds silly. But the idea is that you've removed a roadblock because if the alarm goes off and your feet hit the ground and you're already dressed, it's much harder to say to yourself, I'm just gonna go back to bed. You're up, you're dressed, you're dressed already. Now we just need our shoes and keys and phone and we're out the door. Remove roadblocks. Last part here I want to talk about are things called keystone habits. Keystone meaning that something that's at a point, 
right? So you want to do things each day to start yourself off in the right mindset. I want you to learn to control your emotions right from the start of your day. So one way to do that is to make your bed in the morning. I know you just groaned and rolled your eyes at me, didn't you? But what I'm getting you to do is to do a task first thing in the morning that you can cross off your list of things to do. You cross something off at the beginning of the day, it will give you that dopamine hit we've been talking about, that same dopamine hit that you enjoy from procrastinating and going on TikTok. But in this case, you're getting a, a dopamine hit for doing something positive. It's a positive activity. I promise you it'll make you more productive for the rest of your day. All right. What are some other things that work? Well, I'm going to tell you right now about positive self-talk. We've already talked about negative self-talk, where we're concerned about the fact that we say things to ourselves that make it even more difficult to get started. But positive self-talk is going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about how positive self-talk will help you with your emotional regulation and make you less likely to procrastinate. Research says positive self-talk helps reduce stress, gives you better relationships and increases your self-confidence and actually will give you better or new perspectives when things do go wrong. All right, so I chose a sentence here that we're gonna break down and talk how we can change this negative sounding sentence to a more positive sounding sentence that's going to help. Okay. All right, so this sentence may not be exactly what you're thinking about, but I'm sure you've said something similar to yourself. So I have to finish this long, important project. It should already be done by now and I need to plow through it. So we're gonna take these two sentences and kind of break them up a little bit. We're gonna break them up into these six sections. And we're gonna talk about how we can take that language and turn it into something positive so that at the end, you're actually feeling better about the task at hand and be less likely to procrastinate. All right, so the first phrase that the sentence says was, I have to. And instead of saying, I have to do something, is that, that makes us feel like there's a burden, right? When you say, I have to, um, it's generally not a happy thing. I have to go get ice cream. <laughs> I don't know how many of us say that. I'd like to say that more often, but I have to. I'd rather us start thinking about terms of I choose to, or I get to. Do you see how choosing and getting are more positive? So what you need to do in, when you're thinking about reframing or reframing this particular um, type of talk to yourself, think about when you are negatively speaking about a certain topic or task. And when you realize you're, you're negatively speaking about it, stop and think about what are you actually saying? What emotions are coming with the words that you're saying? And then turn it around and say, what is a more positive thought that I can give myself? I have to, I choose to. So the sentence talked about, I have to finish this long, important project, right? I have to finish. Instead of finish, which is something in the future that we really can't see, right? It's very vague. I'd rather you think about things about starting. What can be done right now? Focus in on that now. Focus in on the small step forward because starting is something that can happen immediately. Finishing is still kind of down the road and it's a little abstract. It's hard to get excited about a finish you can't see. So I mentioned in, that, in those two sentences that it was a long project. Well, instead of looking at it as a long project or a big project or a large paper, Think of it more about being a short task, a series of short tasks. That's where that chunking comes in. You know, if you look at the fact that you have to write a 10 page paper in class, you can't look at the fact that it's a 10 page paper. You've got to break that down somehow. Because if you say to yourself, if you put on a to-do list, write essay, well, that involves a ton of steps, not all of which are very um, easy to, to identify. 
But if you think about a long paper in terms of chunking and short tasks, you're more likely to start work on them. So if you look at that 10 page paper, you say to yourself, hey, I need to have a title page and I need to have a reference page. Why don't I go ahead and at least get those modified? All right, fine. Then I have to write an introduction. So that should be on your to-do list. I have to write um, several body paragraphs. Each body paragraph should be on the list. Then you have to write a conclusion, right? And that should be on the list of things to do. And so even when you're looking at that larger paper, if you break it into shorter tasks, you're more likely to get it done. So sometimes that next smallest task is, like I said, opening the Word doc, opening the Google doc, putting your name on the page or creating the title page. As soon as you've done that, you've started your essay. Do you see where start looks better? You're not finished, that's okay, but you've started it. And then you'll be able with that time management piece and those planners you have, find time to work on the next short task. You wanna ignore the larger picture. You wanna be laser focused on the next thing that you have to do. And that's it. Don't keep thinking about the whole 10 pages later. What's the next small task you need to do? This part gets a little weird and people are a little uncomfortable here. And let me tell you why. So when we talk about something being a long, important project, instead of thinking of things as important or uh, crucial, those are words that make us anxious. Instead, I want you to think about, you're going to take that next small step, and I don't care if it's messy. I don't care if it's not perfect. I don't care if you're going to have to go back and revise it. Did you take the step? Great. We can always go back and fix. We don't want to focus on perfectionism because if we do, it's going to paralyze us. Every sentence in that paper is not going to be perfect the first time you write it down. I have been writing papers for a long time. I was an English major in college. It's all I did. But I guarantee you the, first sen the sentences that I wrote down on those first drafts, I changed a lot and often. You have to give yourself permission to be messy. I will tell you, I have a really good friend that she struggled with writing and you wouldn't know it if you met her. She's highly successful, um, you know, got this great job. She's got several degrees, She's, but she cannot write anything down on paper unless it's perfect. Each sentence has to be perfect before she writes it down. She's had to, she's been working on this one particular article for over five years. And I think at this point she's probably given up. And that's because when she went to start, she did not give herself permission to be imperfect. Every sentence didn't have to be perfect, but she was so uncomfortable with being wrong that she actually froze and she procrastinated because she hoped her future self would be better. And it just hasn't happened. Writing is supposed to be messy. It has a lot of starts and stops. Things that you wrote yesterday are going to look terrible tomorrow. It's just the way it is. Even Stephen King said, when you write something, throw away 50% of it. That's pretty hardcore coming from Stephen King, whose books are huge. So when we think up closely tied to this is this idea of it should be done by now. How many times have we told ourselves that? I should have done this already. This was, oh, why did I wait so long? I want you to change those words to I'll feel terrific. And here's why. When you talk about the word should, it indicates blame and guilt. When you talk about should, it's again about something imaginary something that should have happened. Well, wait a minute, who's to say it should have happened? It didn't. Should means it's imaginary. Let's focus in on what we're doing right now. That's reality. We gotta focus in on that. So let's focus and let's turn that should into I'll feel terrific when, with the idea that you're focusing not on how bad you feel right now, but on how good you'll feel after you complete that first small step. That's what we wanna focus in on. This is probably the harder one. Um, this idea that I need to plow through, that I've gotta 
you know, dig in my heels. I've got to, you know, get in there and do it. Uh, more importantly, like think, saying self things to yourself, like I've got to work all weekend to get this done. What you're doing is putting a lot of action, harsh words into your brain. And that's having a negative reaction. If you tell yourself, I've got to work all weekend, what you're doing is saying, I have to isolate myself to this just one thing. And you begin to resent not only the task, but yourself. And then the negative self-talk starts again. I should have done this. Okay, should is blame, right? We got to get out of these. So we've got to think about getting away from plowing, right? And think about, hey, plenty of time for play. I'm going to have lots of breaks. I'm going to give myself some rewards. And if I get this task, this first thing done, I'm going to watch three TikTok videos of my own choosing. Then we're good. So now we're getting, hey, we did something and now we're still getting a reward. Okay. Those are the kind of things we think about. If you think about little kids, every time they do something, moving forward, what do they get? Stickers, right? How many of us still like stickers? I still like stickers. But it's that idea that you reward yourself along the way. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you accomplish the task. All right. Last bit that I wanted to talk about is what works. What's another thing that works to help us avoid procrastination, to help us overcome that? So do you see how just changing the way you talk to yourself about tasks can change your emotional response to them? You will not be skipping down the hallways this semester thinking about all the homework you have to accomplish. I guarantee you that. But if you see that framing the tasks that you have to do in a more positive light will help you with your emotional regulation, you will feel better. And therefore, you'll be in a better position to do what needs to get done. It will be less of a burden. It'll cause you less anxiety. And so we want to talk about creating good habits to help you with that. Procrastination is a bad habit. Let's talk about good habits. All right, one last poll. Aaron, can you put up that last poll for us? All right, it's an easy question. Yeah, tough day. This is, this is always interesting to me. And while you're doing all this and, and making your choice there, I'm going to tell you, my dad was in the army. And so even if I didn't want to make my bed, <laughs> when you live in a military house, you don't have a choice. And he was one of those people that came and took the quarter and bounced it off your bed and made sure your sheets were nice and tight. Let me tell you, they never bounce real well for me. I, I, I don't know. I can make the bed. I just couldn't make it those super tight corners, but I also am not very good at wrapping gifts. And I think it's the same skill. Just saying. All right. So most of us so far are in the no and sometimes category and that's okay. I'd be surprised if 95% of you said, yep, I get up every morning and make my bed. It's okay. My husband does not make his bed and we sleep in the same bed. It's very confusing. I make my half and he doesn't make his. <laughs> so if you come into my bedroom, it's weird. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just part of that day. All right. We're up to 81%. So I'm going to go ahead and end our poll. We're getting close on time here. So overall, the majority of people say no, they don't make their bed, followed closely by sometimes. And that's okay too. So you're all doing well. So why are we talking about making our bed? Oops, the key here is that we know we need to work on creating good habits and making your bed is a great new habit that I'd like you to think about doing for 2023. And we're gonna talk more about why these good habits work. So I want you to think about the type of person you want to be. It's a new year. Somebody um, on the radio said it's 23 and me this year, which of course um, a lot of people know 23 and me from the DNA testing, but I guess they're naming this year 23 and me, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so you can begin taking small steps today to reinforce who you want to be by the end of 2023. For some of you, graduation's looming, right? You want to be a college graduate. 
by the end of this semester or by the end of December. So you can take those small steps to reinforce who you wanna be because every action that you take is a vote or it's a movement towards the type of person you wanna become. And so think of it in these terms. Every time you write a page, you are a writer. Every time you practice your violin or your clarinet, you're a musician. And every time you start a workout, I don't care what kind of workout it is, every time you start one, you are an athlete. So your identity comes from your habits. So I want to talk about the four stages of habit formation. This is a, the largest last part that we're going to talk about. By the way, for those of you keeping score at home, the procrastination cycle and the stages of habit formation are really good questions that might come up on a survey. I'm just saying. So stages of habit formation. Um, the first one is, uh, I'm sorry, I should say habits that are either good or bad are formed. They don't just appear. So what we're going to do is talk about these stages and how we can create some new positive habits since we're starting off the year. So the first stage is a cue. The cue alerts your attention to a habit and promises a new reward. It triggers your brain to initiate a behavior. Your brain is anticipating or predicting that there'll be a reward once an action is performed. And once a habit is formed, it's, like, uh, it's very unlikely to be forgotten. So we want a good cue to tell us that something is happening, okay? The next stage of habit formation is this craving. So the cue tells us there's gonna be a reward. Craving and what we do for this stage is we have to make it attractive. The cue is the first indication that we're close to a reward. The, this starts the craving. And I don't mean necessarily like you're craving food, but I mean craving meaning that your brain says, huh, I really want that reward. How are we gonna get that? And so without motivation or desire, we don't act, okay? You don't wanna turn on the TV per se, you want to be entertained. The reward is entertainment. The, the cue is seeing the television, the craving, oh, I see the television, oh, I really do wanna catch up on those shows. And then you get to this, make it easy to perform. I keep the remote in an area where I can see it at all times or, or and I'm not digging through the couch looking for it. And then the reward is to make it satisfying. I want to be entertained. Similarly, if you think about it this way, in the morning, you don't wanna put on makeup or do your facial routine. That's not the desire. The reward is to make yourself feel better, to better your appearance, to make you feel more confident. That's the reward. But the cue is you're in the morning and you look at the mirror. And if you have all of the things that you need close at hand to do those things, you're more apt to do that habit. The key too is that if you connect a habit with something you already enjoy, it's easier to put into action. So you can kind of bring them together and call it like a temptation bundle, bring different things together. You can also create a ritual. This is another way to create a habit. You, um, so create a ritual can help and make a difficult task more appealing. So you just get into, a, you know, into this habit. So for example, brushing your teeth. Um, if you hate brushing your teeth, find a toothpaste you like. And then all of a sudden it's a little more attractive, right? A little craving. If you play um, your favorite song while you brush your teeth, now again, that creates a craving. You know that at the end, you'll have listened, the reward will be clean teeth and you'll have had a little bit of fun, okay? So the other part here is about ease. Remember I said it has to be easy to perform. You're not gonna do it if it isn't easy, okay? This is the core of an actual habit. It's the thought or action. It's the actual habit that you perform, okay? So it should be ease of response is the way to look at it. So if the action requires more effort than you're willing to expend, you won't do it. The other thing though, is that you don't wanna to try too hard. 
uh, if you can find new ways to make the habit easier to start, it's even more helpful. So the different ways you can get it to work, that helps. We naturally gravitate towards things that are easy. And so if you want to start a new habit, make it easier for yourself to do that habit. But you've got to be realistic. A habit can only occur if you're actually capable of doing it. If you want to dunk a basketball, but you aren't tall enough to reach the hoop, you are out of luck. And that is not a habit you're going to be able to do. So realize that habits should be of things that you are capable of doing. Oh, and I skipped already. I apologize. Last one, reward. So the actual thing at the end that you want, the response that you do, that ease of response, that response has to deliver a reward. Remember, the cue is about noticing the reward. The craving is about wanting the reward. And the reward does two things. It satisfies us and it also teaches us. For a moment, the reward gives you feelings of contentment and relief from the craving. Isn't this weird how our body works? This is all biochemistry. Reward actually teaches our brain too. If you do the action, you get the reward. Anybody remember Pavlov and all of his dogs and the ringing of the bells and the food and the drooling? Really, your brain is constantly thinking about your environment. What actions satisfy your desires? Which ones bring you pleasure? Your brain gets feedback from all of these actions and feelings of disappointment and pleasure are stored in your brain and your brain evaluates those actions. It wants you to continue to do things you get an emotional high from and stop doing the things that you get nothing from. So the reason procrastination works is that you are getting some high, we know now it's dopamine, from avoiding. And that's why it's a difficult habit to break. All right, if you can maximize all four of these steps, you can turn it into a habit. Without a cue, the craving, and the ease of response, you will not take an action. And without all four of these stages, you, um, without all four of these stages, the action is not gonna be repeated. It won't become a habit. Remember, we wanna form new good habits to replace our bad habit of procrastination. All right. Here's our last quote for the evening. Procrastination is like a credit card. It's a lot of fun until you get the bill, right? We constantly put it off. We're getting a lot of that there. My goal today is that you have a better understanding of why you procrastinate. Hopefully during our time together, you have found some real steps you can take to reduce your procrastination habits. And remember, as you practice not procrastinating, and as you practice forming new habits, give yourself some grace. Have some self-compassion. It's hard. All right. little summary here. before. So we now know that procrastination means we're putting short-term needs first. We want those quick and easy dopamine hits, however we can get them. And so we put those things first. So things that take longer or long-term tasks or long-term projects or long-term goals they're harder to get excited about, to get that dopamine flowing. We have to work at it. So while you're, now that you've had this time with me, I want you to reflect on the reasons why you procrastinate. Think about your habits and the thoughts that lead you to procrastinate. What feelings have led you to procrastinate in the past? How does it make you feel? Are these positive and productive feelings? Or are they negative and you want to change them? The other thing too, is I want you to alter your perspective. I want you to think about the big tasks in terms of smaller pieces and it makes it less intimidating, I promise you. Look for what's appealing about or what you wanna get out of the assignment that you're doing and not just thinking about the grade at the end. There's gotta be more to it. Learning is more than just grades. Commit to starting new habits. If you feel stuck, just simply commit to complete a small task, any task, and write it down. Finish it, reward yourself. Write down on your schedule or to-do list only what you can completely commit to. And if you write it down, follow through no matter what. This is a habit for you to start. Writing it down, following it through. 
By doing that, you'll slowly rebuild trust in yourself that you will really do what you say you will do, which so many procrastinators have lost. Focus on what you want to do, not what you want to avoid. Where are your goals here? Think about the productive reasons for doing the tasks by setting positive, concrete, meaningful learning and achievement goals for yourself this year. Be realistic, avoid, I'm sorry, achieve, achieving goals and changing habits take time. Don't sabotage, sabotage yourself by having unrealistic expectations that you can't meet. Some things are, like I said, just out of our control. So think more practical. What are things that you can do right now that will be helpful? And create new positive habits and be realistic. That's what we want you to do moving forward. And don't forget about good, positive self-talk. Notice how you're thinking and talking to yourself. Talk to yourself in ways that remind you of your goals and replace those old counterproductive habits of that negative self-talk. Instead of saying, I wish I hadn't, say, I will. Reframe the conversation with yourself. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. I know this was a long session. I hope you found our time together useful. If you have any questions or would like to hear more about how we can help at the Academic Support Center, you're welcome to make an appointment with a tutor using Academic Support Net on Okta. You're also welcome to email me directly. I will be here for a few moments uh, to take a few questions before we sign off. Please make sure to answer the survey questions that will come in the email on Friday. And don't forget, make your bed. Thanks so much. Erin, let me know if there happen to be any um, We had one that just asked um, sure. if there is uh, two papers due at the same time at the end of the semester. Do you have any suggestions on how to um, help with that? That's a tough one because I that's pretty true. I was an English major and I pretty much only had papers due at the end of the semester. Um, it's kind of a combination of things. That's going to do a little bit of time management. You need to see how long it's going to take you. So you need to look at the length of the paper, the amount of research that needs to go into it. Um, and you're going to have to block time further out. You need to write papers, uh, start working on papers at least two weeks, two to three weeks in advance. So if you've got two papers going at the same time, you're going to need to start both of them earlier than what you think. And um, I always suggest coming into the Academic Support Center. You can talk to us and brainstorm on more than one paper. So my suggestion is come in, brainstorm, figure out what your outlines are going to be for both of those papers. And then depending on which one or what parts might be shorter, you want to tackle things first, right? Like we just said tonight, taking that next short step. So figuring out that... Um, you may feel like I can't do both papers simultaneously. That's okay. Maybe one paper is the first week and week two is the second paper. So the papers may be going on at different times. You may, may be hitting smaller goals within each paper at different times. But the idea is to make sure that one, you do block time to get things done that's realistic and reasonable. And if you're not sure how to do that, again, come see us. We can help you kind of strategize how to do that even before the papers are due. And then um, for yourself to kind of avoid procrastination is saying, what are the next small steps I can take in each one of these papers to keep propelling me forward? Because that's the key, right? Movement forward is what's gonna help you continue with your creativity. It's gonna continue with your motivation to finish the task. So yeah, it's, that one really is a kind of a combination of knowing when you have time and getting things done to reward yourself. Um, another question was, any advice for someone with ADHD? That's a really good question, actually, because uh, ADHD is a big part of the conversation when it comes to procrastination and time management. Um, what we do know about ADHD, at least what the research tells us, is that uh, people who suffer from ADHD, either in, in small amounts or in large amounts, don't um, have that same emotional regulation that... Um, or same biochemistry. And so um, procrastination may be uh, the, the loop, that feedback loop in your brain about 
what feels good and what not is doesn't always work the same way. So if you have ADHD, you have to just kind of be more hyper aware of what you're doing. Um, the rewards to give yourself at the end may have to be more significant. You probably will have to give yourself a lot more rewards than someone who doesn't have as many issues with ADHD. And that's because, uh, as you know, if you have ADHD, that um, it's that inability to kind of focus because what we want to do is much more appealing than what we're currently doing. And so it almost is taking that next small step to the extreme. So every time you do some even minor step in the direction of getting something done, you reward yourself. The problem is that you may then also have to kind of back up the amount of time you give yourself because it may take you longer to complete something. That's it, Lisa, I think we're, oh, wait. Um, oh. How do I overcome chronic fatigue to complete assignments? My tiredness often interferes with getting through classwork, hard mm -hmm. to focus and think of written responses. Okay. So that one is gonna be a lot harder because you probably also suffer similarly than ADHD. It's almost the other way around, right? Um, in that, you know, sleep and you're dealing more with a medical thing when you have that kind of chronic tiredness. Um, that's going to, I would, my suggestion uh, first is to uh, make sure you're checking in with your health provider that there's not something else going on, because sometimes um, that could be a chemical thing that you may want to have someone look at um, and to kind of help you out. Uh, the thing that you may want to keep in mind, though, is your biorhythms. When are you more productive during the day than not? Um, you will find that some people wake up in the middle of the night and have like an hour where their brain is just kind of on fire and they get a lot of things done. Um, and so when your roommate or your friend is studying and you are exhausted at that time, that may not be the optimal time for you to study. So there is some conversation that you need to have with yourself about when do I feel most productive? When do I feel like things can get done throughout the day? and trying to plan those small steps to fit into those times that work best for you. But it's always good to find someone um, in terms of if you're writing papers or even writing responses to uh, questions on a Moodle shell or anything like that. Uh, you know, Again, the writing center is a great place to come and have somebody kind of work through and give you kind of an idea of, of like typical outlines of things that you can do and say, try to get yourself into that. There it's gonna be about making a pattern or a habit of getting through some of those assignments. I think that's it, Lisa. All right, thanks, Erin, and thanks to all of you, especially those last 63 of you sticking out here at the end, so I appreciate it. Have a wonderful night and looking forward to classes on Monday. Thanks.